Okay, William, thank you very much for coming again as usual. Uh, we really appreciate that. It's very important for us. And I think that the information you present is incredible. And uh, I wish that enough people will be able to, to hear that because this is a, a life-changing information. So again, thank you very much for coming. And as usual, the floor is yours. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I want to start by saying that um, it's not like I read this book every day. It was written 30 years ago. <laughs> but um, during these shows, uh, lectures, has reintroduced me to the original shock <laughs> that got me writing it in the first place. And I dare say the anger, the moral and political anger. So this session today is about some of the raw facts of what is being taught in sex ed classes. Um, and I'll just begin with a couple of well-known skeptics. The first one is a scholar named Paul Vitz. Um, and he reviewed hundreds of standard school textbooks, none of which contained a single reference to marriage as the foundation of the family or a, def a definition of the family or the words husband or wife. <laughs> I found that shocking. And he said, educators may constantly <clears throat> bemoan teenage pregnancy and the frequency of illegitimate children but their own textbooks begin by fostering the notion of family without marriage from grades one to grade four. And here's another well-known American professor named Jacqueline Kazin, who said the objectionable feature of these sex education programs is not that they teach sex, but that they do it so badly, replacing good biological education with 10 to 12 years of compulsory consciousness raising and psychosexual therapy and using the public schools to advance their own peculiar worldview. Now that is the background that we're to everything I'm going to be talking about today. And I have to also say that this is a long chapter. I can't talk about everything in it, but I'm going to be sort of Get going from highlight to highlight, um, and also giving some specific examples from textbooks in so-called sex ed as they were then. Now, I don't think that stale dates anything that I'm saying, because today it's it's just worse, especially with the new advent of all this nonsense about um, choosing your own gender identity and you know, girls thinking they're boys and boys thinking they're girls and all that kind of thing. Uh, so for a while, there was a kind of reaction to what I'm about to tell you among American parents in particular, also Canadian parents. I don't know what's going on in Europe, but um, there was some reaction from parents and some of this got pushed back for a while, but it's come back again with a, with a violence, really. Uh, and it would be interesting at a certain moment to ask ourselves why, like what is underlying this um, radical uh, thrust towards sex education as a tool to break down our love and affiliation uh, for the family, for respect for parents and respect for sexual life itself. Well, this may give you some example. These are some of the things your children may be reading taken from books widely used in North America. Uh, many of them read to or by children as young as 10. The first book I looked into was called Learning About Sex. And by the way, before I did any of this, I went and visited some of the public schools in our area. And I have to say at the time, the private schools were not into this. They were still your traditional sort of, many of them religious-based schools, and they weren't into all this um, new way of um, uh, attacking marriage and family and sexual morality, which has, you know, which was rooted in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, but now all the private schools, at least around my area, have gone the same way. 
you know, like I said before, they're celebrating homosexuality, you know, as a, as a valid choice among any other, as valid as any other choice. They got rainbow sidewalks on, on the school grounds. And one of my grandchildren came home almost crying one day because he said the school was plastered with signs saying gay is okay. Well, we're not going to talk about a lot about homosexuality today. Uh, that's perhaps a later lecture. But I'm, I'm just saying that um, it's invaded everything. There are no, there's no safe ground. The only safe ground actually is religious schools. Um, two of my children have taken their kids out of the public school system and have put them in uh, private uh, Christian schools. Um, and they're just delighted. Uh, with the difference. At any rate, here are some actual examples from this book called A Learning About Sex. The first is on sex with animals. I'm quoting from the book. Um, a fair percentage of people probably have, probably have some sort of sexual contact with an animal during their lifetime, particularly boys who live on farms. There are no indications that such animal contacts are harmful, except for the obvious dangers of pure, poor hygiene, injury by the animal or to the animal, or guilt on part of the human, unquote. And that's found, like I said, in a book distributed to thousands of schools for children as young as 10. Here's what it says on sadomasochism. Quote, sadomasochism may be very acceptable and safe for sexual, sexual partners who know each other's needs and have established agreements for what they want from each other, unquote. Now, I digress just to say that in that sentence, you will smell um, one of the underlying roots of the modern trend in this direction. And that is the idea that the human will uh, should have a hegemony over or dominance over everything. Everything com comes down to will. Uh, for example, the Libertarian Party in my area, uh, the first thing in its program is uh, all citizens have freedom of choice. I probably mentioned this before. It continues to rankle me. So I know the fellow who wrote the uh, platform for the party, and I said, what are you doing? He said, what do you mean? I said, of course all humans have freedom of choice. We can't do anything without freedom of choice. We can't get up. We can't go to the bathroom. We can't eat. We can't work. We can't play. A choice is a given. So why are you making it part of your political platform when it can't be avoided? Uh, he didn't know what to say. And the reason is, like so many others, he's glorifying the idea of the human will as something which should have rule or dominance over every other aspect of life. Um, so that, you know, Choosing something makes it good just because with your will, you chose it. Therefore, you made it good. Uh, I point out to him that we can choose evil. We can choose terrible things. That's the issue. Is your choice good or bad? Not whether or not you chose. You can't help that. And so anyway, sadomasochism, as I say, uh, this entry here, the writer uh, talks about as long as they know each other's needs, that's a will thing, you see, and have established agreements, in other words, voluntary agreements for what they want from each other. You know, I can beat you up, <laughs> bend you in a hundred different positions, bruise you, who knows what, as long as it's something that you want, and we've agreed that's okay. Uh, in other words, your will and my will make the rules. They don't come from society. They don't come from religion or any other external uh, force or reality outside our own being. And by the way, I gave a lecture in, to this group on Gnosticism way back. And in this, we smell a lot of the kind of Gnostic thrust, you know, the idea that the individual has pure knowledge. Uh, it's not out there in the world. It's in me like a spark of my being. And um, I run around trying to express it. I think I mentioned the uh, English fellow before the English Revolution who was into what they call the Levelers Party. 
And uh, he thought with this spark of divine knowledge and his will that he was so pure that all the women he made love with, or today we would say have sex with, uh, would become virgins again <laughs> because they had contact with him. <clears throat> it's a little crazy, if you don't mind me saying so. So here's what this first book also says on free love. Quote, some people are now saying that partnerships, married or unmarried, should not be exclusive. The freedom for both partners to love and share with others should always be present. So again, I digress to say that this is the theme, the theme of, of present commitments being directly attached to your will. And by the way, that's what happened during the French Revolution. And it has happened in every progressive group since. In the French Revolution, they got rid of marriage as any kind of permanent institution. What they said was marriage is a contract which requires the meeting of the minds. That's modern legal language, too, for business contracts and things like that. The meeting of the minds is required. For example, if you and I sign a contract, but you're thinking of something else while you're doing it, like cheating me, and I'm just thinking it's an honest contract, that contract can be voided because there was no meeting of the minds. Well, here we in the French Revolution, um, they didn't like the idea of lifelong marital contracts or commitments. And so their idea was that as soon as one of the spouses simply says that he or she is dissatisfied with the marriage and wants to end it, that's sufficient to end the marriage. Uh, and that was, they called it the revolutionary marriage. And that went on all through the French Revolution. It went back to square one after that. So that's interesting, I think. Again, it comes down to the will. You know, if I decide this marriage is bad, I'm, I'm just going to tell you. So it used to be two to make it, two to break it. Now it's two to make it, one to break it. See, because the will has hegemony. Here's the same book on anal sex. Anal sex refers to the insertion of the male penis into the anus of his partner. Because bacteria live in the rectum, the penis should not be inserted into the vagina or the mouth following anal insertion without being washed first. And like I said, these are 10 year olds being fed this stuff. Um, William, the information is from 30 years ago or uh, you updated 30 years, the information? 30 years ago. I don't think it's gotten better. I think the <laughs> unbelievable. Sex, books, unbelievable. <laughs> sex books today are even worse, even more so-called open, even more open to the idea of the individual will and choice and all that kind of stuff. And they just posture, teachers, they just posture as guides, guiding you to this. Here's something the same book said on lesbianism. For you, exploring sex might mean giving each other orgasms or even making love. Often this kind of sexual exploring is with a friend of your own sex. So what you see here is the normalization. Basically, I always get myself in trouble when I say this in public. They're trying to normalize the abnormal. And that has been the trend of modern liberalism for a hundred years, normalizing the abnormal. When I, when I went out bike riding with my nephew a while back, he fancies himself to be a liberal, although he lives very much like a conservative. I, I said to him, I said, Stefan, I said, the trouble with uh, modern liberalism, and I distinguish that from classical, liberalism, is that it's always about the release of restraints. If we can just relieve the restraints on human will, then everything will be good. And by the way, that wasn't so far from what Jean-Jacques Rousseau was teaching in his many essays and books about this very kind of thing. F freedom of the individual, freedom of choice. All men are born free, he said, and everywhere they are in chains. Of course, that's ridiculous. We're not born free. We're born 100% dependent little beings, and we remain that way for a long time until we grow up. So what was he saying, all men are born free? Uh, see, I don't think I'm misreading him. It was an illusion that was being put about at the time, a romantic illusion. And I use the word romantic in the context of the classical uh, period and then the romantic period. 
and so on. And the Romantic period was about the release of restraints, about everybody, as we would say today, doing their own thing. <laughs> Terrible English, but we know what they mean. Everybody doing their own thing and trying to create a world in which they could do their own thing. In other words, get your foot off my neck. Stop telling me how to be behave. Stop telling me what I can and can't do. Uh, this is the folly of modern liberalism. Here's another book by a fellow named Wardell Pomeroy, PhD guy. Um, his books are full of graphic and glowing descriptions of sex positions, foreplay, homosexual love, and is recommended for grade six children. In fact, he includes a how-to for the whole sequence from first encounter <clears throat> to full intercourse, explaining how to suck nipples, placing the mouth on the girl's vagina, putting the penis in the girl's mouth, etc., all for grade six students. His, his books, two of them especially, one called Boys and Sex and the other one called Girls and Sex, at that time had sold about 5,000 copies in Canada and probably 500,000 uh, in the U.S., which is 10 times our size. So it's not like these were sleeper books just lying around. These were disseminated to the public schools and used in the curriculum. Here's another thing from him on sex with animals. I have known cases of farm boys who have had a, get this, a loving relationship with an animal and who felt good about their behavior. He's talking about sex with the animals. And here's another book from a book called Adolescence Today by a fellow named John Dacey. Here he's speaking about abstinence and self-control. This is a 1984 health textbook recommend, recommended as must reading for grade 10 students uh, in the Pittsburgh, one of the Pittsburgh school districts. It described abstinence and self-discipline as an improper value choice. You see? So there you go, normalizing the abnormal, see? And homosexuality, it calls, quote, a natural stage in sexual development. It encouraged autosexual activity and recommended gang masturbation and masturbation as early as four years of age. Here's a student who participated in a so-called sexuality fair in my province, a town called West Hill, Ontario, reported doing an exercise against his better judgment, but because the teacher told him, in which he was asked by the teacher to open a packet of condoms, put one on a finger, and insert the condom finger into a plastic model of a vagina. Students learned at this sexuality fair that high-risk behavior was vaginal or rectal intercourse without a condom or oral anal contact or sharing sex toys such as dildos and vibrators and sex acts if your partner is bleeding. The lesson was followed by this advice, quote, you have the right, get it? You have the right to decide and choose what you do about sex. Now, this is a this is a barrage against parental authority and against the natural family uh, in which this has always been like their domain. And I'm not saying that all parents teach sexual education in a great way. Mine didn't. <laughs> I actually have to tell you what my father said when he took me aside. He said, I want you to remember one thing. And I said, what's that? He said, a stiff member has no conscience. And that was the only thing he ever said to me about sex education. And I guess he should have known because he got my dear mother pregnant on the couch when she was 19. And I ended up, well, my brother was the result. Uh, in those days, of course, that was a great shameful thing. And uh, all kinds of other things happened to him. He broke his leg in a motorcycle accident. And then she came in to tell him she was pregnant. And then he almost lost his leg with a year of many operations. And they had to get married in a hospital bed. I can still, still see my grandfather standing behind the bed, glowering. He wasn't too happy uh, about this uh, woman. She was actually a very lovely woman who, in his eyes, had destroyed his son's life. 
And so that's why my dad said to me what he said to me. But here we go back to you have a right to, to decide and choose what you do about sex. This message on moral autonomy <clears throat> was courtesy of another um, health unit in uh, my area. Um, and there we have, a, again, we have a Florida counselor told a class that a guideline to tell if the girl is old enough to have sex is if she can reach into her vagina and remove a condom if it is left in. That was published in this school book. In Ontario schools, students are regularly asked to slip condoms onto bananas. In California, it's cucumbers and zucchini. <laughs> in a Washington state report, a scale model of an, of an erect penis with testicles and hair, pubic hair, the whole lot was passed around as the teacher giggled and smirked. That was reported in a magazine that's now defunct called New Dimensions Magazine, uh, which did a great job reporting all this uh, under the radar information. Sue Johnson is a so-called sexologist and the op author of a popular book called Talk Sex for Teenagers gives instruction in how to give a good blowjob, her words, and how to get an abortion, get this, without your parents knowing, and writes that in every school, one in 10 males will be gay. Well, that was the false homosexuality figure that was in the air for 50 years because of Alfred Kinsey's, uh, the Kinsey Report. But uh, many researchers since have uh, revealed how biased his report was because more than half of his subjects were prisoners in the jail system. I guess it was easier for him to walk in and interview them than, than chasing them down because they were they were captured. The real figure on homosexuality, and many countries have done this kind of study, is somewhere between two and two and a half percent if you include bisex, bisexuals for that half percent. Uh, at any rate, trustees of the Carlton School Board near by me again, said, if you have a 13-year-old daughter, I'm quoting, and she goes to the family physician and asks for birth control pills, she'll get them without the parents being told. Here we go. The human will again. Kids have a right to the kind of happiness and security we've been able to build. See? The word right goes back to the word will. Because what is a right except... I mean, I worked hard to find this definition and I'm right now reading a terrific book about called Rights Talk to try, get, try to get a better grip on this. But what is a right really, but a defensible claim? If you can't defend it, what does it matter what you call it? Uh, like I said, someone walks through your property, uh, cutting half your trees down, you say, hey, this is my property. I have a right to private property. You have no right to be here. Fine. But he's cut your trees down and he, whatever, and he's on his way. So if you can't defend your right, it's useless. But in the world we live in today, there's very big problem with rights inflation. Um, not so long ago, when the UN was doing its Declaration of Human Rights, which has many problems, by the way, but it's not such a bad document, <laughs> not like some of the ones that we find in other countries. But um, at that time, there were probably 15 or 20 things that most people would agree on should be human rights. Another day, we'll get into the question of rights and what a right actually is. Like, is it a, is it a substance, an indwelling substance of your being? Or is it an idea that's floating through your mind? Or is it a political choice that you'd like to make and defend? Uh, so I'll leave that for another day, but it does fascinate me. At, at any rate, at that time, there were 15 or 20 of these rights. Uh, today, there's over three or 400 so-called human rights floating all over the world. One of them, believe it or not, is the right to have a toilet. Another one is the right to have internet service, you know, that kind of thing. So there's been rights inflation all over the place, but it's all driven by 
human will. You know, people want it. They demand it. They force their politicians to believe it. Politicians get elected because they listen and they figure they can get more votes if they provide it and that kind of thing. But to me, this is a prostitution of the whole notion of a human right that most of us would defend, like the right to life, the right to liberty. Although I have to qualify that because even the right to liberty has become cheapened. You know, the right to liberty, even in the American Declaration of Independence, where it's listed without qualification, was considered at the time to be a right limited by order, limited by the, the moral code and by the traditions of society. But all that's been dropped. Now it's just become the idea of, I have a right to liberty, you know, freedom and all that. But freedom is an abstract, abstract concept. It doesn't mean anything without a context. What could it possibly mean? Okay, maybe if you're in the very high Arctic, a thousand miles from anybody, you can start shouting about how free you are, but it has no meaning. You're just there in the high Arctic and there's nobody around to interfere with anything you want to do, uh, you see. So the concept of freedom also needs to be examined uh, very closely. Now, I want to move on now to some of these uh, sex games, which are taught in these uh, texts. Um, there are such sex games. For example, guess how many condoms are in the bag? <laughs> the winner gets a free package of condoms. Or the so-called condom lineup. It's used in many North American schools, at least it was, and certain it's widespread now, in which young students wear a placard specifying one of the various stages of lovemaking with a condom. So one kid will be walking around with a placard. Uh, you know, the, the kids are asked to line up and to reflect in sequence. Number one, sexual arousal. That's one placard the kid is wearing. Number two, foreplay. Well, I'm foreplay, he says, you know. Someone else, I'm erection. And that gets lots of giggles from the students, of course. Another one is a placard that says, roll on the condom. Another placard says, leave room at the tip. And another one says, intercourse. Another one says, orgab, orgasm. Another one says, lose erection. And then relaxation. And then hold on to the rim. And then withdraw the penis, et cetera, et cetera. These are kids walking around with these placards, you know, kind of uh, making jokes about all this. And uh, But you better believe it's being drilled into them that... Um, the change of attitude, which is being desired by the, the teachers. There's also lots of books with cartoons showing copulating couples. And in one book uh, I looked at, uh, they told the students it was an assignment, a homework assignment, which was to draw a picture of mother and father making love. Another assignment was to draw nude family members. And... Uh, I can't tell you the last thing they asked them not to forget. It's too gross. In all these materials, students are constantly reminded, you have some decision to make as you grow up about what is right and wrong for you. You get it? Anytime you see a sentence with you repeated three times, you know there's trouble in there. Parental authority and counsel are devalued throughout, or they are ranked along with what you hear from friends or what you see on television. In this anti-family vein, Canada's National Film Board, a highly subsidized film uh, corporation, embarked on a scheme with Health and Welfare Canada to market its 1989 sex video called Growing Up by tucking an advertisement inside the baby bonus envelope, which is sent to 4 million homeowners in every November. See, there's the government getting on side with distributing this stuff to homeowners. Um, the video is designed to give children aged 9 to 12, quote, the courage to follow their hearts wherever they may lead, unquote. Well, that, they're all little baby Rousseau's. That's what this is all about. Follow their hearts wherever they may lead. Really? Wherever they may lead? The video warmly presents homosexuality with the word, these words, quote, two men or two women can have a loving relationship. They have a need for each other, unquote. 
it shows explicit lovemaking via grinning animated cartoons, but it omits any references to marriage, gives a lot of false confidence information about condoms, which I'll talk about soon. You're going to be shocked when you hear it. And it neglects to mention any link between homosexuality and AIDS. And I'll get to that too. Uh, at, the, at the time I was writing this book, I was in contact with Canada's federal government, their Department of Health, and I asked them to send me their report on AIDS, which they don't send around the public. You have to ask for it. So I got it for years, and then I stopped. But what it basically was telling you was that something like, when it started, something like 82% of all AIDS deaths in Canada were among homosexual men. Uh, at the time, they used the word homosexual. And then about a couple of years into all this, because they must have got hell for it, they changed it to MSM, which means men who have sex with men. That was the category you could see. You know, how many MSM have AIDS? How many women? How many babies? You know, a lot of the people who were not homosexuals were either bisexual or they were into sharing needles, uh, drug needles and things like that. And and I think the idea at the time was a lot of babies were getting HIV virus from their mother's milk. Uh, that's a whole dreadful topic, which we'll leave for the moment. At any rate, um, uh, a lot of this comes under the rubric of what I call pansexuality. Now, pansexuality is the idea that everything is inherently sexual and that gender is meaningless. Um, and conferences on these topics are shot through with explicit and implicit anti-parent and anti-marriage sentiment. The most And the most insidious form of comment of all is simple omission. A grade five manual called Facts About You, distributed widely in schools by sanitary napkin manufacturer Kimberly Clark. That's a big company that makes paper napkins and sanitary napkins and so in North America. It advises youngsters repeatedly, quote, to find an older person you can trust, unquote, to discuss sex with. The implication? Parents can't be trusted. After all, Ontario's own premier at the time, a man named Bob, Bob Ray, a very flaky leftist politician, said to a Toronto area high school audience when discussing the environment and other matters, he said they're making decisions and they can make the wrong ones. But one of the things you can do, get this, one of the things you can do is educate your parents. See, so you're talking now about the normal moral hierarchy in all traditional societies as being stood on its head. And the question then comes up like, how did the world get this way? Well, mostly because radicals are very good at organizing themselves and changing society because they realize that most people, not as energetic as them about their vision of perfection, are sheeple. <laughs> They're not going to stand out or raise their voices in any courageous way. Uh, and so on it goes. Here's a quote from the anarchist periodical called The Word. That's, that was the name of their periodical, and I don't even know if it's still being published. <laughs> but their motto was this, simply, free land, free labor, free love. They wanted all those things, you see. At any rate, sex, in short, as I came to realize, is an instrument to manipulate the mood and the values of the people. You can easily relieve a man of his freedom and property if you give him more and freer sexual rights in exchange. Sexual freedom anesthetizes our desire for political freedom. From the start of their welfare state, the Swedes understood this equation. The equation goes, as long as they leave me my sex, the people began to think, I don't care what else they do to me. It is cynical but true. We kiss and hug our way into a condition of political quietude. All very dangerous, if you ask me, and what it's going to take to awaken the people to it, I don't know. I think it's almost too late. 
uh, I should send you my, my video, Harry. I did a six and a half minute video on what I call libertarian socialism. If you want to distribute it to your people, I'd be delighted. And it basically ex explains uh, what happened to classical liberalism as time moved on. It developed a deep contradiction within itself. Uh, originally, a classical liberal foundation was liberty. But then with the rise of the underclass and all the rest of it, it became forced equality. And now no country can proceed for long on a contradiction that deep. So I'm going back to the sexual and bodily thing again. What they did was they split the body politic into two bodies, a private body and a public body. The private body should have all the sexual freedom imaginable. I have to say, uh, 50 years ago, even more, uh, you had none of these things. You had no right to abortion. You had no homosexual rights, no gay marriage rights, no easy divorce rights, no drug rights, uh, no euthanasia rights, and all that kind of thing. And today we have them all. Well, what's happened in a mere half century is uh, the governments of the West have decided uh, the way to keep the people happy and not notice what you're doing with your other hand is give them all these pleasures. All these sexual and bodily pleasures should be theirs, free and easy. At the same time, you can grow the welfare state or the socialist state or whatever you want to call it, in which government services, insofar as practicable, are spread from coast to coast. And they'll all shut up and they won't care how much money you're taking from them because they're happy. Now, I'm, 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 I'm ashamed to say that the people like this. I call it libertarian socialism and the people like it. And so I think it's the last stage of uh, liberal democracy, unlike what Fukuyama said in his book. It was called uh, uh, The End of History and the Last Man, in which he argued that liberal democracy, by that I mean modern liberal democracy, which had nothing to do with classical liberal democracy, is the end stage of human civilization. But I don't think it is. I think libertarian socialism is. And very few see that that is what has happened to our societies and that we have taken this, um, we have taken our part of the bargain gladly and left the government its part of the bargain. Um, William, uh, you mentioned the video that you have about this subject? Pardon me? You mentioned a video that you made yes. about this subject. So yes. uh, where, can, where can I find it, please, so I can publish it? it I love you too. If you go to my website, mm -hmm. uh, you'll see on the top where it says video. And uh, you just look down. Uh, it's called the four, <coughs> the four stages of liberalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it does a, excuse me for being, uh, <laughs> for vaunting myself, <laughs> but I think it does a pretty good job of explaining the thesis, which I have arrived at. And I have to say also, I haven't, I haven't seen it articulated this way anywhere else. So I'm going to claim a certain amount of novelty for it. Uh, not that that helps. I will make sure to, to find it and publish it. <coughs> I just wanted to, to ask if you think that um, um, the motivation of the government to cause all of that um, hypersexuality in children and all the rest of it is some kind of a control mechanism because eventually when people are falling into hypersexuality and developing this obsession, um, it becomes like a, a master that uh, it's like they are being controlled by their vices. Um, yes. Would you agree to that? I think that's well said. Yes, although they don't see it as being controlled by their vices, do they? They see it as um, freedom, enjoy, enjoying their vices. They see it as freedom, <laughs> even though... A lot of them get addicted to these vices, in which case they become slaves to their appetites. So I agree with you that that's the direction of things. But the sad conclusion one comes to is that they don't mind being slaves to their own appetites. What they don't want to is to be slave to someone else's appetites or someone else's direction for how they should live with their own appetites. So the thrust towards individual expression, individual will, uh, get your foot off my neck, all that kind of thinking is deeply buried in this stuff. And that's been developing for over a century and a half. And it, 
it intersects with the notion of rights, which I mentioned earlier, the idea that rights are absolute, not conditional. I think I mentioned in our last talk, because I'm studying this a bit now, that the American version of rights is an individual version. There are individual rights. They don't think for a moment about the common good or what Burke calls social freedom. It's not on the menu. In Canada, maybe a little more on the menu, but Canada has basically followed the same thrust as the Americans. And that's why in the convoy recently, uh, and I have some criticism that I shared with you, uh, when they left the uh, border between Canada and the U.S., uh, it was all about ending the mandates and ending the mask. I loved it. I thought it was great. But they didn't, before they even got to Ottawa, it had transformed into this historical phenomenon about freedom. And they were shouting as loud as they could, freedom! But in a non-contextual way. It, in other words, they sprang the, the theme loose from their original objective. And suddenly it was just about freedom. Well, I don't know about you, but I think, you know, one man's freedom is another man's jail. <laughs> you better find out what he's screaming about before you start clapping. And uh, the freedom without order is chaos and anarchy. Uh, that's what I believe anyway. And anywhere that freedom has been tried without any order, uh, chaos has arisen. Can, can we invite you for a conversation or even perhaps a debate about the issue of rights and freedoms? Yeah, sure. I hope I know enough to have a debate with, with whoever, but yeah, I'd enjoy, I'd enjoy that. Um, okay, I will set it up with you. Yeah. Thank you. In any case, I'm arguing here that, in fact, all revolutionaries quickly see that to change the sexual, uh, the social order, and we talked about this in uh, my talk on Sweden, you first have to change the sexual order. If you can change the sexual order of society uh, from its traditional role of a procreative entity uh, that dictates much of our social reality, like sexual roles, economic roles, socialization of gender, etc. So by redefining the sexual nature of the family, you can redefine society itself. The long and short of this strategy is that those who wish to engineer society in any direction uh, must first break all the traditional moral and religious sexual allegiances. And that's exactly what's been going on, as, as I have said, especially since the Swedes started doing it in the otherwise free democracies. Sexuality must be progressively divested of all its spiritual, procreative, and family meanings, divested even of its connection with romantic love, uh, to which in our culture it has previously always been inferior. And in its place you must, must in its place must be put an increasing emphasis on raw sexuality as a pure and joyous expression of the autonomous self. So see, here we have this fragmentation of the human molecule into human atoms, the idea of the joyous expression of the autonomous self. You're talking about little atoms, the people wandering around, unconnected from each other, looking for a joyous expression sexually. All other connections between sex and loftier ideals loftier than egalitarian ideals, let's say, must be discouraged. Thoroughly broken down, sexuality will be utterly narcissistic, self-directed, masturbatory, and pansexual. It will no longer lead us up to God, which you find in Christian Platonism, or up to the sacrosanctity of marriage, our traditional belief, or even up to a better character, like sex as an earned privilege of maturity, if you're getting nervous listening to this, so am I. It's the first time the pattern has seemed so thoroughly and chillingly complete. The way to destroy the hierarchical, hierarchical authority of a whole social and moral order, to smash the vertical allegiances to God, family, and moral ideals, and reduce everyone to a condition of hungry receptivity, is simply to attack the sexual assumptions of society. The rest will take care of itself. No master plan is required. Once a society of control turns into a society of release, the rest follows as the night the day. 
So that's kind of my intro to this uh, terrible subject. Um, and I want to move on and uh, talk about some of the key players. Uh, you've probably heard of one uh, called Magnus Hirschfeld, and you certainly heard of Bertrand Russell and uh, Sigmund Freud and a variety of fellow travelers from what used to be called the social hygiene movement. In 1928, the World League for Sex Reform, get that? As long ago as that, almost 100 years ago, got started on its social hygiene movement, on the mental hygiene movement and the race hygiene movement, including such nut bars as William Reich, a Freudian Marxist who claimed that instinct is the deepest and purest layer of our being and therefore needs obeying by us. These people, uh, Reich targeted the family, I'm quoting him now, as the chief institutional instrument of repressive authority, unquote. And he argued that just as a political revolution was required to overthrow the state, a moral revolution was required to overthrow the family. And that's what all our lectures here uh, have been talking about. Uh, sex education becomes the main weapon, therefore, in an ideological war against the family. And in, its aim is to divest the parents of their moral authority, undercut them. And again, from Reef comes this. With John Dewey, Wilhelm Reich is one of the great theorists of the child as the agent of social change. Hear that? The child is an agent of social change. By the way, Reich was eventually convicted of fraud and he died in the federal penitentiary, but not doing all, not before doing all this kind of damage. You know, before about 1945, 1965 period, sex education in the schools was restricted to the study of basic biological knowledge, you know, the birds and the bees. Classes for boys and girls in sexual education were separate in order to preserve their natural modesty. But by 1964, the key American organization for the dissemination of the new sexual philosophy was called CIECAS, it's an acronym, for the Sex Information and Education Council of the United States. So CIECAS. And the Canadian affiliate is called CIECAN. They're still around. Both organizations, and you'll see how this tied into my one of my past lectures, took their lead from the Swedish model uh, created by L.C. Altenson Jensen, which was formerly instituted as early as 1942. And both of them have links to a battery of sex therapist organizations, as well as to so-called Planned Parenthood. By the way, Planned Parenthood is not about parenthood. It's about planning no parenthood like helping you not to be a parent. Many of the, this is interesting, <laughs> many of the original contributors to this key book were signatories to the Humanist Manifesto. I don't know how many of your listeners have heard of the Humanist Manifesto, but I recommend you go online and Google it and have a good read uh, because there was one in 1932 called Humanist Manifesto 1, and then Humanist Manifesto 2 was published in 1973. We should know what it preaches, despite the fact that it's a highly self-contradictory document and of low intellectual value. It clearly sums up the entire philosophy of so-called secular humanism that is today so much in the air, and it has been signed by hundreds of intellectual and political dignitaries, such as John Dewey, Isaac Asimov, Sir Herman Bondi, Sidney Hook, Sir Alfred Eyre, B.F. Skinner and Julian Huxley, and then, of course, by all the routine first wave feminists like uh, Be Betty Friedan, also by economists like Gunnar Myrdal, who played such a role in the Swedish transformation. OK, uh, I use the word it preaches, the manifesto preaches, because the signatories, listen to this, they refer to themselves as religious humanists. How do they do that is a bit unclear, but they do describe themselves in public as religious humanists, especially when they go after the state for the kinds of tax breaks that religious, the true religious organizations get. Um, they are the founders of what they call a, quote, vital, frank, and fearless religion capable of furnishing adequate social goals 
and personal satisfactions, unquote, to the whole world. The essence of this religion, which denies any supernatural reality, is the worship of man himself, or what I call the man god, with a capital M and a small g. So the man god, it leads me to advertise a little bit, by the way, if anybody in your group ever wants to know what has been going on with what we call a democracy. I wrote a book a while back called The Trouble with Democracy. And it speaks a lot about this whole business of human beings fancying themselves to be human gods and uh, all kinds of other developments in the theory of democracy from the Greeks uh, to the present time. It's a very difficult book, so I wouldn't uh, recommend it uh, for everybody. Uh, but if you want to learn about what's happened to democracy in the Western world, I think that's the book. So here's just some of the things in the manifesto, which find their way into these sex ed books and into the schools. Ask yourself if this is what most parents are teaching their children. Well, some probably are, but not most. One, religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. And that's just a slap on the face, of course, to the whole religious tradition. Well, to most religious traditions, they call it self-existing. Um, <laughs> I can't resist the um, joke about the graffiti <laughs> that I saw in downtown Toronto one night out for a walk. The first line says, said God is dead and was signed Nietzsche. And the second line said Nietzsche is dead and was signed God. So it was, anyway, it was amusing. Um, but these people give no explanation how you get something from nothing. Now, the ancients weren't so stupid. They said in Latin, ex nihilo nihil fit, which means nothing, I mean absolutely nothing, comes from nothing, from absolutely nothing. How, how can you get something from nothing? And when they answer, which they always do, it's very glib, they say, well, they say, well the universe uh, was self-created. And then I reply, well, in order to create itself, it would have to pre-exist itself. How could a universe pre-exist itself in order to create itself? And they go silent. Uh, there's no more argument. Here's another point. Religious, there's lots of them. I'm not going to go through them all. But religious humanism considers the complete realization of human personality to be the end of man's life and seeks its development and fulfillment in the here and now. Well, we don't need to get into the religious uh, um, objections to this kind of thing, simply to say that note how solitary and how individualistic this thesis is. The complete realization of human personality to be the end of man's life. See, in other words, it's up to each of you to create the end of your life and your personality and that will be the highest fulfillment. They believe that religion must work increasingly for joy in living. Religious humanists aim to foster the creative of man and to encourage achievements that add to the satisfaction of life. Sex ed is a prime vehicle to steer children away from the idea of sexuality as linked to the sanctity of marriage, family, or the spirituality of religion and towards the narcissism of sexual pleasure alone. All self-control is characterized as repressive and authoritarian. And here's what I call the corker. These uh, secular humanists are firmly convinced that get existing acquisitive and profit-motivated society has shown itself to be inadequate and that a radical change in methods, controls, and motives must be instituted. A socialized and cooperative economic order must be established to the end that the equitable distribution of the means of life be possible. Humanists share a demand a shared life in a shared world. This is obviously simply pure socialism. Now, the works of which lie about us in failure and ruins. <laughs> like I said to my leftist friends, <laughs> you're the kind of person who thinks that when the Berlin Wall came down, all the Germans ran to the east. But that's just a bit of a laugh. So again, in Humanist Manifesto number two, they say 
we affirm that moral values derive their source from human experience. Ethics, get this, ethics is autonomous and situational, needing no theological or ideological sanction. Um, in the area of sexuality, we believe that intolerant attitudes, often cultivated by orthodox religions and puritanical cultures, unduly repress sexual conduct. The right, get, get the word, the right to birth control, the right to abortion, and the right to divorce should be recognized. Individuals should be permitted to express their sexual proclivities and pursue their lifestyles as desired. Moral education for children and adults is an important way of developing awareness and sexual maturity. But you see what they mean. They mean for unrestricted libertinism. And that's what they mean. Uh, some people objected, of course, even places like Sweden. A Swedish professor named Eric Prodan, he wrote, quote, sex education in the schools was a necessary preparation for a society in which the family, as it was traditionally known, <clears throat> was to be eliminated. His words, eliminated. Uh, Canada struck a committee in the late 70s, early 80s called the Badgley Commission to investigate all this. And as early as 1977, they concluded that sex ed was a failure and that its findings, quote, do not lend support for the usefulness of current contraceptive and family life education in the schools. Now, this was a big turnaround at the time because um, we find more liberal sexual attitudes and behavior among students, and they said, and unprecedented increases in abortion, disease, illegitimacy, and promiscuity uh, among our youth. My own babysitter, when I was writing this book, had a book called The Living Family. Uh, and it asked students who have finished the section entitled Getting Married to do only one bit of homework. Find a student of the opposite sex and draft your own cohabitation agreement coming from a teacher. To hell with marriage. Cohabitation is fine. You draft your own agreement. Never mentioning the fact that cohabiting uh, couples... One second, William. Forgive me for a second. I think you're breaking up. Um, Sorry. Do, do you also have the same problem? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I, I think I can. Sorry about that. And then we get the what they call, um, terrible word, euthenics, which is um, a combination of um, eugenics and ethics. They call it euthenics. Or improving humankind environmentally. One, one second, my friend, please forgive me, but I think you're mm -hmm. breaking up. Uh, or maybe just on my side. Um, quickly, can you tell me if you have the, pro the same problem? That was fine to me, Guy Harry. Ah, it's fine on your side. So uh, I will just log off and come back one moment, please. <clears throat> because if you're speaking, mate, there's no sound coming out. Hello. Like it's a night for technical problems, William. <laughs> is it a, is it a problem at my end? No, no, you're coming through loud and clear. Pickley <laughs> speaking, but there's nothing coming out at all. Pickley, there's no no sound at all, buddy. Uh, oh, no, sorry, mate. I, I, I don't know, guys, if you can hear me. Everything I, is broken on my side. Uh, I can't hear uh, anything. Apologies, I left my mic open. That's all it was. Yes, I can hear you fine, Harry. Please continue. Sorry, guys. Uh, shall I start? Restart? <laughs> uh, you should restart, but uh, unfortunately, someone else have to help me because I cannot hear anything. 
I, I, I'm here. And so is Pickley, I think. And John. Wait, you can't hear... Yeah, okay. You should be able to come back and hear us, hopefully. But yeah, you don't need to do anything, William. You don't need to restart okay. or anything, I don't mm-hmm. think. Just wait for mm-hmm. uh, webinar to come back and hopefully we can resume. Well, you just tell me when to start and I'll... <clears throat> No worries. Yeah, here he is. He's here now. Harry, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. I apologize. Now, William, please go on. Okay, yeah. so now I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> what turned out to be the failures of sex ed. And if you don't find this a dramatic condemnation of the whole bloody thing, I'll be surprised. Planned Parenthood is sometimes pretty honest organization. And they published, a, well, a publication in the summer of 1973 called Family Planning Perspectives. This is after sex ed had been in the air for like 20 years or more. And it showed that teens who regularly use the pill experience a pregnancy rate four to five times higher than that of older women using the pill. In 1976, they did a follow-up study and set the rate at 5.8% teen pregnancy for girls using the pill. A Cornell University study in 1987 showed an 18% pregnancy rate in the first year of use among teenagers who use the pill with a high rate of compliance. In other words, they're doing everything right. They're not sticking it in their ear, you know what I mean? So they're doing everything right and still getting pregnant at that rate. And then we get to things like sexually transmitted diseases, which everybody argued at the time when sex ed came on board, they would be, uh, um, they would vanish. They would be conquered. The rate of sexually transmitted diseases, or what we call STDs, among teens is three times higher than the general population. Many of these diseases, such as herpes, genital warts, and papillomavirus, are incurable. Chlamydia is epidemic at 30%, and females sexually active at 16 and under are twice as likely to get cervical cancer. And that comes from the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. A recent World Organization report indicated that one in 20 teenagers contacts some some form of STD every year, which means two people every five seconds, at least in the U.S. and Canada. Now I come to a section called There's No Such Thing as Safe Sex. All sex is increasingly risky. Uh, Here's some material from the Journal of the American Medical Association. They showed that the rate of AIDS transmission among couples using condoms when only one partner was infected was 17%. And that was only in a short year and a half period. To clarify, 17% of previously uninfected partners got AIDS from their infected condom-wearing partners. And we are recommending condoms to our children as protection. On June 19th, 1987, this is a really interesting, interesting situation. Dr. Mary Crenshaw, she was past president of the American Association of Sex Educators. And she had a, she was at a meeting with 800 sexologists at the World Congress of Sexology. It's not a joke, in Heidelberg. And she said, quote, to the audience, she got up and spoke and she said, if you had available the partner of your dreams and knew that person carried the HIV virus, would you rely on a condom for protection? Not a single person raised a hand. None of the 800 sexologists raised a hand. So she accused them all of giving irresponsible advice to youth. I'll say. Condoms, it turns out, and I was really surprised to find this out. I actually wrote to Canada's Department of Health and Welfare, as it was called at the time, and I said, I understand the government does condom testing. Could you please send me the rates of failure Uh, present rates of failure of condoms that you are testing. It turns out the condoms have an overall failure rate for preventing pregnancy of 10%. 
that was published in a magazine called Population Reports. And they have an even higher rate in the prevention of AIDS transmission because the virus is so small. And here I'm going to share a little story with you. At the time, I was writing for a newspaper called the Edmonton Journal, and I did an article for them on uh, the HIV transmission and the folly of thinking that condoms were going to help you. This is at a time when schools like my old school were putting condom machines in the boys' and the girls' washrooms all through the school with this false belief that this was going to cut down the transmission of HIV. So in order to get um, super factual for my article, I con contacted uh, a fellow at the U.S. Naval Research Department who wrote an article for a journal called Rubber Technology. And he sent me some microscopic pictures or images of a typical condom, a variety of condoms. These were just microscopic, I mean, highly microscopic pictures of the latex that's used in condoms. You could see holes all through them. And so I called him back and I said, what's going on? There's holes in all these pictures. He said, yeah, but sperm can't get through. But the HIV virus, which is like a thousand times smaller, can go through an ordinary condom like a bullet through a tennis net. That's what he said, quote unquote, to me. So I put that in the book. I thought to say that the HIV virus can go through an ordinary condom like a bullet through a tennis net is incredibly alarming, should be incredibly alarming to any teacher who is making condoms available to their students. A standard health and welfare Canada test of condoms. Now I'm reporting on what they sent me. Um, Condoms manufactured over a three-year period reported, I couldn't believe it, reported a 40% failure rate for all the lots that were tested at the point of manufacture. And they were based on, in other words, they went into the actual companies that manufacture condoms, took their testing machinery, and said, we want to test your condoms right here. It's, it's a very stringent three-part test of pressure, volume, and leakage, specifically 40% of the sample failed at least one of those three tests. The 1991 performance, which is a few years later, reported what they call an improved 28% failure rate. So that's the story on the equipment that we're selling to kids um, to make safe sex, so-called, and to help protect them from HIV. I'm going to end up now by saying that there was a revolt uh, that came to this sex ed revolution, uh, probably began with President Reagan in 1981. He endorsed the passage through the U.S. Congress of the Adolescent Family Life Act, um, which at long last openly confirmed the dependent status of act, uh, adolescents in sexual matters. Of course, this uh, this law has always, uh, of course, this the law has always done in matters of driving, uh, entering contracts, obtaining marriage licenses, purchasing alcohol or cigarettes, accessing pornography or borrowing money, and so on. Now, the law has always had specific conditions for youth, except in sex. How sexuality escaped this net of adult supervision has been the subject of this chapter. Predictably, Planned Parenthood and the Alan Guttmacher Institute launched a suit against the U.S. government's program on the grounds that teaching abstinence in the schools is equivalent to teaching religion. That was the basis of their case. Well, if teaching abstinence is religion, what is teaching indulgence? Is it teaching about hell? Uh, but anyway, they lost their case, but they've not given up. And these people uh, simply continue on their on their battle. Even a poll commissioned by Planned Parenthood itself showed that 70 percent of parents wanted sex ed to teach morals and to urge students not to have sex. This was all a reaction to the MVE we talked about last time and the sex ed revolution. With They wanted heavy parental involvement 
and a stress on abstinence and the skills involved in saying no effectively, meaning, and this is crucial, without losing the love and respect of the boyfriend or girlfriend. It's overwhelmingly successful, this protest by parents has been overwhelmingly successful in reducing sexual activity, illegitimacy, disease, and abortion among uh, American youth. Um, a lot of other schools came up with what they call opting in provisions, where, okay, you can teach all the sex that you want, but not to my kid if, if I don't have them opt in. Kid leaves the classroom, goes to the library to do whatever, but I don't want my kids to be part of that brainwashing, that sort of thing. Of course, teachers hate opting out clauses. Predictably, predictably the over, get this, two million strong U.S. National Education Association is trying to sue for the repeal of such laws, uh, as I am recommending here for Canadians. At its July 1991 convention in Miami, uh, the association passed all sorts of re resolutions demanding, get this, the right of teachers to determine what is taught in the schools, regardless of the wishes of parents, and the right to be, quote, legally protected from censorship and lawsuits, unquote. In her scathing book, A Parent's Survival Guide to the Public Schools, author and former teacher Sally Reed, who has also authored uh, a book called The National Education Association, colon, Propaganda Front of the Radical Left. She refers to the public schools, and I'm in complete sympathy with her, as indoctrination centers for collectivism. A book of the same title could be written about the various Canadian teachers unions and those in probably most European uh, countries. The war against the family in our society is neatly summed up in the clash between these convict, uh, conflicting moral and legal demands. And I bring it to an end. Uh, that's fantastic, William. Um, I'm pitching in. But uh, this last bit, uh, because uh, we're not as saying it's got to the uh, connection issues there. But uh, no, thank you so much. That's really brilliant. We always appreciate hearing for your, from your work. And um, that closing part in particular, I think it sounds really good. So uh, yeah, thank no, I you. I appreciate, I appreciate you having me again. Oh, as always, it's our pleasure. So yeah, you take care. Yeah. And uh, we'll be on see next you. week. We'll see you next week. Next week, next week, next week, next week, we're going to talk about um, this was looking after their values. Next week is going to be about looking after their bodies. Like what's actually happening to Western children when they enroll in uh, public schools? Uh, what's happening to their bodies? You know, fitness and health. Uh, this happens to be an area I'm quite familiar with. My business, uh, one of my businesses was running a super sophisticated medical fitness operations for about 6,000 professional and medical uh, business uh, type members. Uh, so we, we got pretty good at understanding uh, what's at risk here. And I think you're gonna be a little shocked to hear some of that too. By the way, it's still the case that in private schools in Canada and North America, Sports and fitness, for example, are mandatory uh, in most of these schools. You can't get out of them unless you have a doctor's note <laughs> telling them that you're sick because they're not going to believe you. <laughs> and there's a good reason. When I went to private school, uh, sometimes guys, I don't know, would just want to break. So they'd go tell the nurse they had a cold, and she checked them into the infirmary, and she put the thermometer in their mouths. <laughs> And they got laughs out of when she left the room, said, I'll be back in a few minutes. They took the thermometer out and put it on the heater, on the radiator, which would drive their temperature up. <laughs> well, they only got caught doing this after a long tradition <laughs> because one of the boys left it on the radiator so long that the thermometer exploded <laughs> and they got onto the trick. <laughs> At any rate, uh, sport has been a huge part of my life and I'll be happy to share with you uh, my thoughts on what's going on in the schools and I guess to my children and your children if they're in public schools. Okay, over and out and thank you again for having me.
Bless you. Um, well, then, uh, if, if you're able to hear us at the minute, please give me a thumbs up in the admin chat and you can end the recording when you're ready. Otherwise, uh, I guess I'll do it. I will end the recording. Um, thank you very much, William. Thank you. And see you next week again. Thank you.